Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson. Here on the hump day edition of The Yard, we were supposed to have a baseball game to recap today, but we don't. It's probably a good thing that we don't. It was a weird night in the Southeastern Conference. We're going to get into some of that too, as well as some things that I've been involved in. It's always fun, right? Uh, before we get too deep in the weeds, let's, uh, let's send our well wishes out to many of you that are dealing with a lot of this weather stuff. I, I tell you, you know, we, we got a roof leak here, and I wanted to get angry about it, but I thought to myself, man, we got people around our state that don't have a home. I'm not going to sit here and cry too much about a leaky roof. You know, hey, it's part of the deal. If you don't take care of a house, it'll fall down around you. And uh, some of our our neighbors, no matter their averting interest, are dealing with some very severe weather today and last night. I've got many friends that uh, you know live in the central Mississippi area that say it was a, it was a very difficult night. And uh, you know we're blessed to be able to wake up today. It's truly the case. And uh, most of us are waking up uh, much like we did yesterday. It's a little bit worse for wear, but all that I understood. A lot of people out there dealing with some pretty, pretty serious stuff today. And uh, listen, our thoughts and prayers go out to all of you and everybody dealing with that stuff in South Mississippi today. As you guys know, I am a very proud South Mississippian. And I uh, got a lot of family down there. And, uh, you know, you always kind of keep up with stuff just because of the fact that it's like, you know, there are some things that happen around the world and around the country you can just kind of put a pin in and say, well, it doesn't really affect me. So I'm not going to exert a lot of emotional energy as it relates to that. But, uh, Man, when people you love are in harm's way, yeah, it gets to you. Matter of fact, uh, my agent last night, I was texting with him as he and and uh, his uh, female companion were in the closet, kind of hunkering down because of the weather. And uh, I haven't reached him today. That's not atypical. Uh, he's uh, he's a guy sometimes that doesn't uh, doesn't text right back. But I've called a couple times, just trying to make sure they're okay. But uh, a lot of you are dealing with that, and we're sensitive to that. For sure. Hey, let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company, longtime sponsors of the show. I love Bulldog Burger Company. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have Bulldog Burger Company tomorrow. That's the plan anyway. It's Thursday. I think it's a good day to eat a hamburger. Every day is a good day to eat a hamburger. It really is. You know, your doctor may disagree, but, you know, what does he know or she know? What's life without a little whimsy? You can enjoy Bulldog Burger Company at three great locations, University Drive in Stark, Vegas, Gloucester Street in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Listen, I'm a big advocate for that dessert to go. Uh, what I encourage you to do, like before you ask for the check, you know, as you're beginning to kind of wind down your meal, say, hey, I think I want to get that Nutella shake to go, or perhaps there's a special shake this week that you, uh, you know, simply have a hankering for. And say, hey, once you get that together and you can get your, your check and your shake at the same time so you can pay and you can slurp that bad boy down and ride that ride home with a smile. Yeah, have the spring rolls as your appetizer. They'll make you and everybody around you better looking. We all need more of that. We do. Make the world a more beautiful place. Eat more spring rolls. We should put that on a T-shirt. Should. Hint, hint, Bulldog Burger Company. Uh, in addition to that, Find your own favorites. I encourage you, if you're a new beat of Bulldog Burger Company, and chances are you're not, but uh, let's get the Bulldog first. Start there, and you can get to enjoy the quality of the cuisine that's available to you there. And then maybe next time we branch out a little bit, get that smokehouse. Uh, last time we ate at Bulldog Burger Company, Dana got the smokehouse. I got the, uh, the mushroom and Swiss, and it was electric. It was. I had the onion rings, too. I'm not a big onion scab, but I love onion rings. I know it's weird, but it's true. My wife tells me all the time, it's weird that you don't like onions. I didn't choose this life. This life chose me. I think if you study in Leviticus, you'll find out that anybody that puts onions in potato salad is going to probably experience eternal damnation, but that's just my interpretation. Uh, but nevertheless, Bulldog Burger Company, a great place to go dine out with friends or family, uh, have an adult beverage. I got those uh, Tuesday night flights. You can go in there and uh, just kind of enjoy winding down a little bit. Uh, but when you're in our area or you're in Bulldog Burger Company's area, be sure and stop in and let them feed you. Let them take care of you. They'll do a great job. Great food, great price, great atmosphere. Everything you need at Bulldog Burger Company. The place where people go to meet, M-E-A-T. All right. So yesterday, you know, we had uh, the news that they were, uh, you know, canceling the baseball game. They didn't postpone it or reschedule it. They just canceled it. 
and looking at RPI stuff, probably smart. Now, what, part of the consideration, and I know, listen, those, for those of us that live in the greater Starkville area, those of us that live in the Golden Triangle, we think, ah, oh, you know, it's barely going to rain. One of, the, one of the considerations that the administration has to consider is the safety of fans traveling to and from ball games. It's true. And with uh, the weather expected to worsen last night, the right decision was made. Not to mention, you know, to find guys at uh, UAB. I mean, they're coming over here to play a ball game. We want them to get home safely as well. And so travel considerations have to be part of the deal. It's true. It's true. It's the right decision. Now, I'm kind of left, what am I going to do with myself? Well, I, you know what? I go by to spa a little while, spend some time with Dana. And if you hadn't, um, you hadn't booked the flow to True Rest, you should. You can download the app, the True Rest app, or you can call 662-268-7601 and talk to my lovely bride. She is a registered nurse. She can answer any of your health-related questions as it, re- as it pertains to floating. Busy day yesterday, too, for sure. Uh, but anyway, you can check in with her. And uh, so I spent some time down there, and I said, look, babe, I'm going to go home work on the book. Anytime that I get some downtime, I've been scheduling like one and a half writing days a week uh, for the, the dude and the biography of Duty Noble, and I'm having a blast. Every one of these books are like my children. And what I mean by that is because you pour so much of yourself into them, and then you turn them loose on the world and put them up for scrutiny, right? And some people are going to love it, and some people are going to love them. And some people are not going to like it, and some people are going to say, you know what, this is a disappointment. You know what? And that's okay. That's perfectly okay. But I'm being very painstaking in my research for this book. I have written some books in the past, and uh, you, you make a lot of mistakes in the first printing. That's, that's the glory of the first edition, right? And then you find out when you put it out there, you know, oh, we missed this, missed that. You know, every one of my books in the second printing, we've had to kind of fine-tune some things. And, you know, listen, I want them all to be perfect when they're published, but it doesn't always work out that way. I mean, some of the great works of our time had a lot of mistakes in the first couple printings. But um, I'm human. I do make those mistakes, as do the people that are responsible for uh, putting these records together. You're not just this year, but last year and uh, days gone by. And, you know, before the digital age, I mean, all this stuff was collected manually and recorded manually. And so you're more likely to have a mistake because you don't have an electronic record. And it's so much more difficult to change such things because... Nowadays, we have, you know, there's so much media, right? I mean, I don't just mean like ESPN, the SEC Network, you know, the beat writers such as myself and others. You know, everybody does a great job kind of capturing the moment, right? And so you've got, you know, sometimes six, seven, eight, nine recaps of a game out there. And so it's easy to find information to validate your record keeping. That wasn't always the case, especially back, you know, pre-World War II, you know, I've got uh, copies of the uh, M Book of Athletics. I've got both of them. I've got the one for A&M College. I've got the one for Mississippi State College. They are like biblical references to me. And I want to thank Mr. Bailey for putting all this stuff together. And uh, hey, to his family, if you're listening, if you have those old record books, Mississippi State would like to have them back. Uh, but all that I understood, I'm working through last night. And uh, chapter 10, this is going to come out around 20. So we're about halfway finished. And my goal was to be done by the end of May. So we'd have the month of June to kind of finish editing and things like that. And, and the, the previous nine chapters are already going through the editing process. And that is a laborious undertaking because you've got to do a ton of fact checking, especially in these uh, historical type books. And that's not to say that we're going to be perfect, but I'm trying to be perfect. And so I sit down last night, and um, your know, chapter nine kind of details a couple of uh, Southern League baseball championships for your Diamond Dogs. It also uh, chronicles the final varsity football season for Duty Noble as a head coach. Yeah, it didn't go quite as well as we'd hoped. Interesting note, I think I shared this before, but Duty Noble, our guy, was the head football coach in four different Egg Bowls. And, of course, they weren't called Egg Bowls until 1927. But uh, uh, because of that big outbreak in 26, when our great-great-grandfathers you know, took wooden chairs to each other after Ole Miss uh, tore our field goals down. But prior to that, there was, there was just the rivalry game. But Duty Noble was the football coach in four of them, and Mississippi A&M won all four of them. 
the tough part of it for Noble is that he was on the other sideline for three of them. But his final year as a football coach was in 1922, and I think he was somewhat emboldened by the fact that he had kind of figured his baseball thing out a little bit. Duty came home to Mississippi State in 1920. We had an eight and eight record that year, but we also prevented Ole Miss from winning the SIAA baseball title that year. So while we didn't have a great year, we were able to kind of play spoiler. In 1921, Mississippi State wins the conference championship. Now, our league was in transition then. Uh, and you'll read about this in the book. But uh, many of the schools of the SIAA, at the time it had 30 members. And it was basically everybody that played major college athletics across the South. I mean, uh, Millsaps and Samford and Mississippi College were all in the same league with State and Ole Miss and Georgia and Florida and Alabama. Yes, yeah, true. True story. But there was a rift, and you'll have to read the book to find out what the rift was about. There were really three central issues that were at, at play here. So in 1921... Uh, over a dozen schools, including Mississippi A&M, left the SIAA to form the Southern Conference. Now, the chairman of that was Dr. Sanford from Georgia. That name sounds familiar? Yeah, Sanford Stadium there, Georgia. Some big names mentioned in this. Matter of fact, in uh, one segment there, Mississippi State played Illinois in baseball for several years, and uh, that was around the time that Red Grange was a member of the Fighting Illini football team. Yeah, how cool was that? But anyway, so we make the move, and in 1922, we win again. This is all documented. I mean, it's not like I'm breaking news here. You know, we won back-to-back conference championships. So in three years, Duty Noble had won two conference championships. In 23, we returned a pretty good team, including Buddy Meyer, who was honored this last weekend, you know, be enshrined in the Ron Polk Ring of Honor. I can tell you that has been a labor of love for me and some other people. It's something that we've been after for a few years. And uh, I had somebody come to me earlier this year and say, you know, Steve, if you could get one of your legacy guys in this year, because there's about a half dozen guys that I continue to stump for, who would it be? Well, I actually gave another name. My number two name was Buddy Meyer. And so uh, really happy to see Buddy inducted. And and, uh, you're going to learn a lot more about Buddy Meyer and guys like Monroe Mitchell and Cotton Cleanworth. Uh, when you read the, the dude, then those are names that you're not very familiar with. And you should be, because they are basically kind of the pillars on what we've built a baseball program on. And again, I, I say this all the time, and it hurts some people's feelings, but we didn't start playing baseball in 1985. We started in 1885. And uh, I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds, but sometimes there's some factual things that, uh, that are reported as facts that aren't facts. And it, and it still happens today. You know, uh, I'm, I'm happy to help. Uh, but that, that said, so I'm working through this 1923 baseball season, which was, was pretty good. We didn't win it that year. We had a pretty good team, though. And uh, just kind of working through, finding some recaps of games, kind of constructing a narrative here. And then I noticed all of a sudden there was a variance in the record books between Mississippi State and Ole Miss. So, well, this is just isn't right. Something's not right here. Because the two schools don't agree on the records. They don't agree on who won. They don't agree on the scores. And uh, so basically what happened is I'm like, well, this, this just doesn't work. How can one school claim one thing and one the other? So Ole Miss claims that they won four games. All four games against Mississippi State. You can pull it up in their own record books. You don't have to take my word for it. You can go see it yourself. Matter of fact, I'm going to dial it up right here. I just happen to have the Ole Miss media guide pulled up on the computer. In 1904, Ole Miss claims to have won uh, two out of three games against Mississippi State. They claim to have lost the first one, seven to six, and then won six, five, eight, seven. I'm like, well, that, that's interesting. That's interesting because when I dip over here to the Mississippi State side of things and I have this trusty media guide, we haven't printed a media guide since 2020, Uh, but I have one and it is a resource that I use. I wish that I had, um, I wish I could update it because what happens is I I can work to a certain point then I got to go back, you know, uh, and check it out here. But uh, back to the 23 season on the Mississippi State side of things, 
And thanks to who I'm sure Greg Campbell deserves some recognition for this, who's now back in Indiana. But uh, Greg Campbell, like you could go online and Google Mississippi State 1923 baseball schedule, and it's on Hell State. Bulldogs went 14 and 9 that year. And among those 14 wins were some wins against Ole Miss. Now, remember, Ole Miss reports it two games to one in favor of them, but in fact, it wasn't two games to one in their favor. And uh, I'm just sitting here looking at my, my notes here to make sure I have all this correct. Because, you know, you, you look at it long enough, you can convince yourself of almost anything, right? But um, uh, to make a long story short here, State says they won 3-1. and one. Ole Miss says 4-0. Oh. and oh. And um, so I went out and said, well, well, how do we verify who's right? Well, thankfully nowadays, a lot of newspapers are archived online from back in that era. And lo and behold, I find some uh, game recaps that validate Mississippi State's accounting of that good series. And so I fire off an email to some folks in media relations and say, hey, here's what I found. Here is a PDF of the newspaper that kind of validates this. And so you start working through it. And I'm like, well, well how does this impact the, the overall series record? And I did not know until last night that Mississippi State and Ole Miss both report different all-time records. Were you aware of that? And maybe I've just missed it. Heading into the weekend, Mississippi State reports a record of 264, 211, and 5 in favor of State. Ole Miss has it at 255, 214, and 5. So there are nine less wins for Mississippi State and three more for Ole Miss. That's a dozen games difference. I also found out, too, that there are six games missing from those totals. You, you begin to kind of add it up here, do the math on it. Mississippi State says that they've uh, met Ole Miss on the football, on, excuse me, on the baseball field 480 times. Ole Miss says it's 474. So six games completely omitted from the records and some others that they claim victories they didn't win. And so I, I wrote all this in an article on uh, jeanspage.com in the wee hours of the morning. Matter of fact, I got in bed this morning at uh, 5 o'clock. Because I'm like a dog with a bone, right? It's like I find this 1923 thing, and I had to even stop working on the book. I said, I've got to address this, especially when I found out that the all-time series records had such a variance. I'm like, you know what? I set, fire that email off about 23, and I'm thinking, well, there's still some games here in the balance. I wonder if we can find them. I wonder if we can find them. Well, lo and behold, we could. And uh, one of the things, and I want to share this with you because this was not included in the article. If you've read the article, you're probably like, Steve, just don't rehash the whole thing. I'm not going to. Cool your jets, sir. But uh, the one that bothered me, I said, you know what? Because I found a variance in uh, 1904. I found a variance in 1908, 1923, 1936. And I even found one in the 60s. But again, I, I think you can just kind of attribute that to the fact that just somebody made a keen error somewhere. But uh, the one that worried me, I said, you know what? I probably won't be able to find verification of the 1904 series. And again, that's the one where State claims to have won two out of three, and Ole Miss claims to have won two out of three. Well, lo and behold, we're able to find it. I mean, let that sink in for a second. I mean, really, the beauty and majesty and glory of the fact that uh, we have the ability as a people to go find a recap of a game, and in this situation, a series of games, from 1904, that's 120 years ago. And it ran in a May 10th, 1904 edition of the Commercial Dispatch in Columbus, Mississippi. So Columbus, stand up. Our friend Ben works over there. But I'm going to read you the accounting of this game just because I want you to understand how thorough this research has been, but also, too, the fact this is not even about me. I'm the one shining a light on this. But the big thing, my big takeaway from this, and, and I've been told about a couple of variances. I've talked to some other former Mississippi State uh, baseball SIDs. And he goes, hey, we've got this rub, too, with this school. You know what? I'm going to do that, too. I'm going to go find that stuff, too. But I think what this article and what the research shows is that Mississippi State has done a tremendous job over the years 
when it's come to baseball record keeping. Now, and we're missing some records. We are. But as Lee, we got the one law stuff right. We got the Letterman right. And, and many of those Letterman, of course, somebody just kind of needs to do the research to uh, list them by their full names and not just their initials. And uh, to be honest with you, that's maybe a good summer project for me. Because I think it's important. And one of the fun things is working through all this stuff and finding the baseball nicknames. That's amazing. Like, you know, Izzy, right? Izzy Turner. You ever heard of Izzy Turner? Yeah. Izzy Turner is a guy. You know, uh, Bump Peel. You familiar with Bump? No, but you should be, right? And that's the joy of writing. That's the joy of, of researching and doing historical books is to shine lights on names that we have forgotten or not yet learned. It's amazing. I love it, man. I do. It's a, it's a passion for me. But um, let me uh, let me. Bulldog fans, many of us grew up in a time we didn't lock our doors. We didn't feel the need to. We didn't have a need to. But the world is a much different place today than it was when we were much younger. Surely you've seen your neighbors have these video doorbells and things of that nature. You can have the same peace of mind, but also the convenience that you grew up with with our friends at Eufy. That's E-U-F-Y. Very, 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 very simple product here. Very easy to install, and you set it up with just a Phillips screwdriver. No drilling required, no power tools, anything like that. You get the keyless entry. You don't have to fumble around with the keys when you got your hands full. You never have to worry about your kids losing their keys, or perhaps you've got a rental property and you worry about people passing that key around. You also don't have the anxiety of having this battery that goes down on you. It's Guys, you got four months of power here, and you get a low battery notification before it runs out so you can charge it back up. It's pretty simple. There's no monthly fee, unlike a lot of other brands that charge you that fee. You can have your recordings locally and never have to pay for storage. Uh, Eufy is also on standby for you 24-7, and you can get a worry-free experience with an 18-month warranty, all backed by our professional customer service team. Contact them anytime by telephone, email, or even live chat, which is awfully, awfully convenient. And here's the thing. There's just so much out there in the world these days. Wouldn't it be nice to know maybe who visited your door when you're out or perhaps have the security of knowing that you've got video surveillance anytime somebody comes to your door? We well, you absolutely can. Make sure that you look for Eufy Video Lock. That's visit E U F y official.com slash video lock to see how you can gain complete troll of your door. All right, Bulldog fans, let's go ahead and admit it. Mississippi State folks and boots are awful fond of one another. Our friends at Tecovis are back to get you ready for this festival and concert season. You know it's going to be all about boots, and Tecovis is your stop for festival style. Tecovis has seasonal and limited edition offerings this spring, including men's and women's boots, apparel, hats, bags, and so much more. All Tecovis boots are made by hand in a time-honored tradition with timeless styles that are always on trend. And Tecovis has first wear comfort with little to no break-in period. It's hard to find that level of comfort paired with this level of style. Plus, their direct-to-consumer pricing keeps value on your feet and money in your pocket. Stop by your local Tacova store, have a complimentary drink or two, and shop new styles. The smell of fresh leather and a friendly staff are always at your service. Many stores even have leather custom branding to make your boots truly personalized. And with regular live music and events coming up, there's no in-store experience quite like theirs. If you can't make it into a store, just visit Tacovas. That's T-E-C-O-V-A-S dot com. They offer free shipping on all boots as well as free returns and exchanges, and ship right to your door. Go to tecovis.com today and find your new favorite pair of boots. i share with you this, some, some things from this accounting. Matter of fact, I may just read the whole thing, right? And again, this is 1904. There is no byline, or I would credit the writer. But the headline of this report says, Great Games. University of Mississippi and Agricultural College teams played fine ball. That's the cut line. The three games of baseball which were played by the University of Mississippi and agricultural college teams in this city on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday afternoons were fine exhibitions 
and were witnessed by large and enthusiastic crowds each day. A few students of the Agricultural College came over with the team from that institution on Thursday, and a number of others came on the following day. Though the largest number, I'm having a scroll while I read here, were present yesterday, meaning Saturday, this ran in the Sunday paper, when there were perhaps 100 of the boys here for the purpose of witnessing and there's some mistakes, some grammatical and typesetting errors, the final game of the series, quite a number of the students of the Industrial Institute and College witnessed Friday's game and not only enjoyed the contest themselves, but added materially to the pleasure of others who were present, for a great many of the A&M boys have sisters, cousins, and sweethearts who are students at the IINC and the people of Columbus are always glad of an opportunity to see the students of this institution in which they take so much pride. That's quite a run-on sentence there, sir. But the IIC, of course, is now the W. The IIC had a much longer name that uh, would embarrass some people, I'm sure. Those of you that have attended the W are aware of the original nomenclature of the W. But, uh, yeah, I I am sure for all these young military cadets at A&M College to go over to Columbus to see a ball game, and all of a sudden – a lot of the lady folks show up from the, uh, from the W, or the IINC, it's what they were called back then. I'm sure they did add to the pleasure of others because uh, those guys record many of those girls. All right, so here we go to the games. All the games were characterized by good work, though the boys were somewhat handicapped by the rough siat of the diamond. That's the word our generation hasn't truly embraced, which has been used very little this year. Of course, condition. That's your synonym. That's a writer just kind of showing off his vocab right there. Both teams had evidently been used to smooth grounds for the difficulty which they exhibited in judging balls was quite, it should be noticeable, but it says noticeable. We're not going to take that one in the nomenclature or the lexicon. Uh, They played ball with Vim. However, and there was no lack of enthusiasm either on the field or among the people who occupied the grandstand. Thursday was a beautifully clear and bright day, and a large and enthusiastic crowd assembled at the fairgrounds to witness the opening game of the series. Walton and Moss were at the points for the university, while Carter and Morris formed the battery for the Agricultural College. Considering the fact that the diamond was rather rough, both sides played good ball, the game resulting in a victory for the Agricultural College by the score of 10 to 11. Now, it's interesting to me, because, you know, this is not a new phenomenon, But why was the Columbus paper just down the road from us reporting this as 10 to 11? It makes me think the writer here may have been old miseducated, right? Because, right, I I think they've written an unbiased account here, but I think that's rather interesting, right? The Aggies won 11 to 10, but it's it's written the Agricultural College by a score of 10 to 11, as as if it's an upset of sorts. Uh, The arrival of Fair, the crack first baseman of the university, on Friday, materially strengthened that aggregation, and the Oxford boys won Friday's game by a score of 7-2. On Friday, the university battery was composed of Lacey and Moss, while Clisby and Morrow offici- officiated in a like capacity for the Agricultural College. That's us. A hard rain fell, on Diamond, uh, fell yesterday morning, and the Diamond was consequentially in a fearful condition when the game was called at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Considering the grounds, however, the game was resulted in a victory for the Agricultural College by a score of 4-3. to three. And that time, he gets, he gets it right. That, it's, you know what I'm saying? It's weird. It's just, And again, I'm judging somebody from over 100 years ago. But uh, it's interesting, especially when their first baseman was the crack first baseman, and our guys just got no adjectives next to their names. But uh, the Agricultural College wins by a score of 4-3, to three, and it was a very good one. During the series, Mr. Emmett Mahan, or Mahan of this city – acted as umpire. Odd has given universal satisfaction his work having received unstinted praise from the public as well as the members of both opposing teams. So that's your recap. From the fine folks at the Columbus Dispatch from May 10th, 1904, and yes, this account verifies that Mississippi State's records are correct. Now, I'm not going to go through every year with you. I just wanted to share a couple things with you because Number one, I'm excited about this. I mean, how often do you get an opportunity uh, to, really, to write about something 
of significance that basically everybody has kind of accepted as fact for the most part. And the truth of the matter is neither of the schools really want to be at odds over the records. You want the records to reflect what actually happened. And so in this situation here, 1904, Mississippi State won the series against Ole Miss in Columbus, as duly noted in the Mississippi State record books and in inverse standing with the Ole Miss record books. And again, I think it's important to understand this is nobody alive's fault, right? What happens is like, again, you you take a job and you just kind of assume, okay, I've got a job to do. And there's a million things to do. There's more things nowadays that are being asked of media relations people than ever before. They didn't have social media back then, you know, back in the 1900s. And I'm from the 1900s. I was born in 72. But uh, you get my point there. You know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the resources. And now that so many of these newspapers are archived online, I, I think there is probably an opportunity here for somebody and as Mike Nemeth mentioned, maybe even a cottage business for somebody, not me, uh, that could, hey, say, listen, we'll go examine your records and, and make sure they're correct. And it's not just about a matter of opinion. You could, there's some, for the most part, and, and I, I found some games too that are difficult to find, but for the most part, you can find written accounts at the very least scores. I've been very fortunate to find box scores. And uh, th- sometimes I found some articles in the Birmingham News and the Memphis Commercial Appeal and even the, the Clarion Ledger that, uh, you know, take up half a page, kind of detailing a game or a weekend series. So that information is now available. And so I have um, collected the articles that verify Mississippi State's accounting of the games in question. And uh, we afforded that information on to Ole Miss and to others. And uh, my hope is we can get – an agreement, and it's really nothing to squabble about because we have the written accounts. It's not a matter of opinion. We have evidence now that supports Mississippi State's record books as it pertains to the series with Ole Miss. It's absolutely accurate, and I have gone through every year and every game, every single one of them, and found the variants. And you can begin to imagine how tedious the work could be, but you get the state book out, you get the Ole Miss book out, and you go, okay, 1903, this is what we said, this is what they said. And then, you know, you just mark, you just tick them off as you go, and then all of a sudden you find a discrepancy. Well, then you have to investigate that discrepancy and then go to to the archives and try to find uh, a newspaper accounting to determine who was right and who was wrong. So this isn't about making anybody look bad. This isn't about, you know, working through this and saying, oh, you know, you guys are, are idiots. That's not the case because, I mean, do you really think, let's be honest about this. There's nobody at any university right now pouring over records from the early 1900s they say man we got to make sure this stuff's right you're focused on today the only reason this stuff has been uncovered is because i'm writing a book about that period and i want this research to be accurate and along the way i found some other games too i found several non-conference games that don't involve mississippi state that Ole Miss actually won that's not reflected in there I, to, to, truth of the matter is i probably found about 40 games so far and i'm not going to keep digging unless it pertains to mississippi state Uh, But about 40 games that aren't reflected in the Ole Miss record books, they won about 25 of them. And so I found about 25 more wins for Ole Miss. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to make sure that what I write in the dude is absolutely factual. And along the way, if we can correct the record, no matter who it benefits, that needs to be done as well. And, again, I'm not – this is not a gotcha moment. That's not at all what I'm trying to insinuate. Uh, because I, I can tell you, I, I go back and read some of my own books or somebody will share something with me. And I, uh, th- there have been times that I've, I've gotten locations wrong, right? I mean, something as simple as that. You know, and I just beat myself up about that. It's like, oh, that game was played in Jackson. I've got it listed as being played in Starkville. And lo and behold, eventually somebody always messages me and I go back and look and say, how did I miss this? But you can't take that personal. You're human. But uh, you want the record to reflect the actual occurrence of events when you can. And now that we've got factual evidence to support that, my hope is that now Mississippi State and Ole Miss can come to an agreement on, hey, this is what the record really is. This is who won and where and when. And moving forward, the baseball records of both schools will reflect an accurate representation of what actually took place. The Mississippi State actually uh, did a really good job kind of keeping this stuff together. And uh, for those scribes that were part of the Reflector staff years and years and years ago, they did a great job too. 
I didn't even have to resort to going to the archives and look through the special collections, though, because of the fact that there were newspaper accounts, because, hey, it's big-time baseball. Even back then, it was big-time baseball. And again, I've been told there is a variance in the Alabama-Mississippi State series, a couple games there. And I'm going to find that, too. I'm determined to. You know, it's like I may do it I may do it like on a day off or whatever, but the reality of it is I think it's important. This is the era in which I work, right? And as I told you guys before, I don't know how long all this is going to last. I may have a heart attack and die tomorrow. I mean, God forbid. But that may happen. But when I look back, and I've got so much respect, when I go back and like I'm, all this research that I've done about Duty Noble, you know, I've had so many things and some stories out there that told stories and other ones that just kind of created stories. You know, they had a couple nuggets in there and then all of a sudden you go to the family and you're like, oh yeah, that's what that means. And there's so many people that did such a great job covering sports. Even back like in the 1950s and 40s. And many of them didn't get a byline. Which is interesting to me too, right? I mean, they just wrote copy and somebody ran it. They didn't get credit for it. I mean, God forbid that happened today. I mean, how many people out there these days, I mean, they live for their byline, right? But, um, but I share that with you because I think it's important to understand that, um, you know, we're all working kind of with the knowledge and the hope that everybody before us have done a great job kind of documenting what's happened for future generations. And uh, I've, I was interviewed recently... And uh, people were asking me, you know, about the research and the the stuff that I do. And I said, you know, the truth of the matter is I'm not just thinking about correcting the records. And I'm not just thinking about entertaining and educating you. I'm thinking about the next guy or gal that comes along, say, 30, 40 years from now. And I want them to have that same amount of appreciation for me and the work that I did that I do for the people that preceded me. Because everybody's kind of building upon each other. And so my hope is, you know, we can go back and correct some things. Uh, because, again, we're all human. And, and it's just like in 1962, I believe it was, you know, Ole Miss has the record correct for this year. But in their media guide, a game is missing. It's just missing. And I guarantee it's just whoever keyed that in when they began to digitize things. You know, maybe they had a smoke break or the phone rang or whatever, and then they got back and said, yeah, I've already recorded this game. They just missed listing the game. And so let's all give each other a break here. But uh, I think it's important when we can not just accurately report what's happening today, but when we can dip back, you know, when the occasion comes for us to kind of go back and say, you know what, hey, this isn't right, rather than us just live with it, let's think, let's, let's get it done. Right. Let's fix it, especially now that we have, you know, physical evidence that is available to us really because of the magic of the Internet, really for the first time in a long time. I mean, nobody's going to go back and dig up all those newspapers, but now that they're online, you can go find them. And then you can go you know, clip them yourself and, and print them and save them and, and share them with your friends and say, hey, guys, hey, we've got this game that says we won this game 6-4. You guys have you guys won in four or 6-4. Here's the newspaper account. And uh, in many of these, I've found multiple newspaper accounts. And again, this isn't about me. Uh, it's just simply about we've uncovered something that enables Mississippi State and Ole Miss to be in agreement about the number of games played and the, the series record. I think that is a remarkable thing. It's something I'm very, very proud of. Uh, and so the, the things the, that we afforded to Ole Miss so far prior to this, I haven't heard back about today, but uh, you know, I found some non-conference games. Uh, very professional, very, very, very professional. You know, comments like, hey, anything that you guys find that can help us improve the quality of our records, uh, we're certainly happy to have. And uh, I think that's the attitude that we should all have. And and trust me, if I had found a situation where it went the other way and Mississippi State was in the wrong, I'd report that too. you got to have ethics and scruples in what you do. Uh, you absolutely do. And uh, so for you, those, those folks at Alabama, there's a, from what I'm told, I haven't done the research yet, From what I'm told, there is a two-game variance in the uh, Mississippi State and Alabama baseball record series, and that's next up on my list. We're going to get that knocked out, too. This isn't about an old Miss thing. This is about, hey, uh, what's right, what's wrong. Matter of fact, once I get done with all this stuff, when I get done with Alabama, I'm going to review every SEC record and make sure that that we are in alignment with everybody else within the conference, what the records are and what they should be. And – 
And if they're wrong, if so, there's a variant somewhere, we're going to investigate that and see if we can't get down to the matter so that everybody can report accurate records. That's the, what. There's no value in records if they're not inaccurate, right? And again, that's not casting a shot at anybody. It's just you know, so much has happened since World War II, right? I mean, every one of those, there was a scorebook somewhere or somebody had this. And, you know, uh, I've even read some things in some, some college yearbooks that's incorrect. It's true. And again, you have to allow the symptom of being human here, right? Somebody sat down and had a typo. I mean, I can't count how many times that I've had them in, in articles this week, you know. Uh, but I have the ability to go back and change it on the Internet. I mean, once that stuff was you know, typeset and print, it's in a newspaper, you know, it doesn't get revised. You know, it's just, it is what it is. We live in a, a much more forgiving age in that respect. Uh, but I just wanted to share that and kind of go into kind of the details a little deeper. And many of you have, uh, uh, the comments on the article have been very, very, very good. And, and uh, I certainly appreciate all the well wishes. But um, I just feel a duty and a responsibility uh, as a Mississippi State baseball historian, and really historian of, of, of most of Bulldog sports. Um, of course, baseball is more of a passion for me. But uh there's a lot more mistakes that can be made because of the number of games played. I mean, you know, back in those days, football, we'd play six to eight games a year. You know, we'd play 20-plus in baseball. And so uh, – and if you can find an accounting of those games, it's important, uh, you know, to have that to kind of verify what you know. But I just feel that, hey, number one, I have the time, the passion, the energy for this. And so let's use it for something positive like correcting the record and, and not just pointing fingers at somebody else and saying, look at you guys, you idiots, because we're all going to make those mistakes. Every one of us. And I guarantee you at some point I'm going to find a mistake in the Mississippi State records. As a matter of fact, I referenced the M, the M, uh, M State Book of Athletics, the M Book of Athletics that Mr. Bailey wrote, John Wendell Bailey. I found a mistake in one of his uh, accountings in 1923 just yesterday. He listed we played on Georgia on back-to-back -back days. We actually played a double header because of the fact that their train got delayed due to a wreck outside of Birmingham and they missed their connection. They even got in cars and tried to, you know, make it over here and play. By the time they got here, it was dusk and we couldn't play, so we decided to play a doubleheader. But the accounting in the in the M book of athletics is incorrect. Now we had the scores right, right? We just have a date wrong. It's a minor thing, but it's still important for the record to reflect what actually happened. And so uh, that's an important part of this for me, and I think that you guys uh, probably see it the same way. Uh, again, thanks so much for your well wishes, but we're not done. We're not done. And as I encounter things, Suter Duty Noble stuff, but you know, this summer I'm going to spend some time kind of working on some of that stuff too, just because of the fact that I'm, I'm always looking for things to write about. But um, guys, I'm getting old. I am. I'm, I'm getting old. And at some point I'm going to age out. And uh, the thing that I think about with all of this is that, um, you know, I, I want to ensure that I leave a quality record for the people that kind of go behind us. Not just because you deserve it, but Mississippi State deserves it. Time for today's top 10 list is always brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair. B-L-A-I-R. Blair is a mortgage professional. He's my friend, your friend, our collective friend in the mortgage industry. If you're looking for a mortgage, maybe you're looking for a game day condo, Maybe you've often wondered, could we pull that off? Well, Blair can let you know. He can get you pre-qualified. And maybe you're looking to buy a home for the first time. Maybe you're being relocated. Maybe you're transitioning within your professional life, and you know what? Hey, we got to pack up and relocate, guys. Rather than just, you know, hey, let's just go with, uh, you know, some fly-by-night company. Go with a guy with 23 years of experience. Recently made the move to Priority One Mortgage. The same level of service went with him. Blair has been in the top 1% and close ratio three consecutive years nationally. Thus, the name close with Blair. If you're a person that's maybe an atypical borrower, you know, I, I don't know your situation, but I can assure you, if anybody can get it done, it's Blair. Blair's a bulldog, a season ticket holder in multiple sports. He has a place here in Starkville, uh, based out of uh, Madison, Mississippi. Give Blair a text or call today at 601-500-2344, 601-500-2344. Uh, you know, the magic awaits you, right? It's true. It can be uncomfortable going through this process because they ask for everything. You know, a note from your mom, a pint of blood, you know, 
link of your child's first haircut. You know, there's all a lock. Pardon me. But you understand what I mean. You need somebody that knows how to navigate through all that stuff. And that's Blair. So take the stress out of the, the whole equation and deal with a mortgage professional like Blair Chandler. All right. A uh, lot of good response to our 60s list. A lot, lot from the Facebook crowd. A lot of people said, Steve, I loved it. I loved it. Now, I'm going to tell you, this list today was much more difficult to put together. Much more difficult. And uh, I I had to leave some bands out. I'm not going to tell you which bands we left out, but I want to throw them a bone at the end. This is a tough one, man. And I can only begin to imagine how difficult it's going to be in the 80s. Because that was a real peak in rock music. In many respects, it's been downhill ever since. It's true. You know it. You Nirvana listeners need to get over yourself. You know it's true. But the 70s were tough, man. And part of the reason the 70s are so tough is because album rock became a thing, right? I mean, in the 50s and better part of the 60s, people were buying singles. People were buying 45s. But in the 70s, it was much more difficult to get a record deal. And people were doing long play albums. And these guys could really play. Like nowadays, it's so watered down right? It's like anybody can play. Anybody can get a record deal. And if you can't get a record deal, you can record independently and push it out of social media to try to get some interaction, gain some traction. The next thing you know, you're, you're a quote recording artist. I get it. You chase your dreams. I understand it. It was a much different dynamic back then. We didn't have all this technology we have today. You can record an album at home. Now, Back in those days, you had to uh, schedule studio time and then go in there and do all these cuts and overdubs and then produce your album, mix it, and then send it to press. And I remember reading the uh, or watching the uh, Kansas documentary. That's one of the bands that didn't make our list today. Uh, the Kansas documentary, they talked about how they recorded an album and just kind of sat around forever. And the next thing you know, the world changed when that record hit the, hit the radio. Uh, so here we go. And not all these are going to be radio hits, but most of them are, are songs and names you know. Or they wouldn't be recognized as being the best song of their year. And again, this is in no chron- this is in chronological order, not in my order of uh, favorites. All right, number 70, excuse me, number 70. In 1970, we began to see a change in rock music. Of course, Led Zeppelin began to kind of usher this stuff in. The Beatles, of course, got a little more uh, experimental and kind of got away from the doo-wop thing, all the harmonies and things like that. Uh, the guitar tones began to change as we began to see advancements in pedal boards and things of that nature. The amplification uh, changed. We tried to have more of a distorted sound. And then a band that came out that really, in my, in my estimation, and I think in the opinion of most people, really was... The pioneers of heavy metal. It's Black Sabbath's Paranoid, which introduced us to Ozzy Osbourne, who's still kicking 54 years later. (laughs) If that was on your bingo card, congratulations, you've won. But 1970, Paranoid from Black Sabbath. Could have gone War Pigs here, but uh, Paranoid's the song that really kind of put them out there. And I think every young guitar player learns to play Paranoid. Number one, it's a cool song to play. It's also a very simple song to play. Number 70, number seven. I, I got to get off that format. All right, 1971. This is a tough one for a lot of people, not for me. And I think, I, I don't know that I could go to bed at night with that lady that uh, shares my last name in my residence without this one, but it's Led up one Stairway to Heaven. It's really an easy call. I mean, it really is. In many, in many respects, I think it's the greatest song of all time. It's certainly the greatest guitar solo. I don't know if there's ever been a solo that's ever been better, better fitted for a song than this one. I love the poetry in this, and uh, there's some incredible articles out there to kind of explain kind of the cryptic nature and what they're trying to express. And uh, it's, it's very, very, very well done, as you guys will know. All right, 1972. You know, we didn't have Cream on our 1960s list. I threw them a, a, a bit of a bone. But we're going to go with Derek and the Dominoes because of Eric Clapton and the great song Layla, which was the second most rock song played that year. It's true. And, and a lot of things that were called rock back then weren't rock. This one truly is. One of the greatest guitar players of our lifetime, Eric Clapton. 
uh, singing a song about George Harrison's wife. How about that? Lily, you got me on my knees. Yeah. All right, 1973. And this was a tough one. This was a very, very, very tough one. You know, Kiss had a lot of albums out at this point. I guess they, a couple albums out. Leonard Skinner was around. But I went with probably one of the most iconic songs from America's greatest rock band. It's Dream On from Aerosmith. That's your 1973 selection. That first album, that self-titled Aerosmith album, is absolutely incredible. And uh, if you go back and listen to it, it wasn't mastered exceptionally well. It's not like the record company put a ton of money behind the album. Uh, they've attempted to kind of remaster it, but of course a lot of that was recorded on an analog tape. It wasn't digital. And even with today's technology, it's been very difficult uh, to kind of enhance the quality of that album. But One Way Street and some other songs on there, just phenomenal. Uh, One Way Street inspired me to pick up the harmonica. But Dream On, an iconic song from an iconic band from a very, very great year in rock and roll. All right, 1974. Another tough one here. Could have gone a lot of different directions. But this is a band that certainly deserved to be on here. Again, part of the British invasion in many respects. It's bad company. Can't get enough. I can't get enough of your love. And I hope you can't get enough of the Boneyard or Jeans Page or True Rest. Uh, great track, Paul Rogers, an absolutely phenomenal vocalist in the words of Ben Howland. Absolutely love Bad Company. And the thing about Bad Company is, is even the songs that are the deeper tracks on the album are great. When I mean, you go back and listen, everybody's got 10 from 6, right? You got that Greatest Hits Bad Company CD. And, but man, I would encourage you sometimes to get a little deeper in the catalog. There's some great, great tracks that I don't know they get enough pub these days. That's what happens. The farther we get away from it, the more we forget kind of those friend songs, the songs that were deeper on, on the, the B-sides or what we call them these days, and you forget the quality of these Bad Company albums. But I uh, can't get enough. That was really kind of the breakthrough track for them. And again, Paul Rogers, in my estimation, one of the best blues vocalists of all time. All right, number 75. And an easy call for me. I don't know how it would be for you. Of course, Kiss is really kind of in their heyday. Skinner was uh, doing some cool things. The Eagles were doing some good things. But I got to go Bohemian Rhapsody right here by Freddie Mercury and Queen from the Night of the Opera album. It is absolutely incredible. Uh, sonically, it's great. And uh, if you've seen the movie, you, you understand how tedious the recording process was. They really pushed in many respects to get this thing out there. And... Uh, it's a legendary song that the, the, the children of today are familiar with. And I want to thank Wayne's World uh, for kind of ushering Bohemian Rhapsody into a new generation. There are a lot of people out there that didn't know the song. Of course, everybody knew We Will Rock You, Another One Bites of Dust. Maybe Crazy Little Thing Called Love, Killer Queen. But when Bohemian Rhapsody was part of the Wayne's World movie, all of a sudden, the song had new life. And, of course, when the movie comes out, it, it reintroduces the song and the power and majesty of the great Freddie Mercury. 1976, there was a time in my life, you know, that um, you know, when uh, my wife and I got together, you know, and, and uh, we began to cohabitate. You know, there's all this stuff because, you know, when you leave, your parents are like, hey, get all, take all your stuff from your room, all the stuff in the back of your closet. If you want it, you better take it or we're going to throw it away. And so in the middle of all this stuff that my wife had, she had, um, as a teenager, all these old notebooks from school and things like that. They're just, you know, all back there. And so before we threw them all away, we kind of thumbed through them. And I was very entertained. She was kind of embarrassed. I was entertained. Because it appears that my wife, even back in those days, you know, was a rocker. And uh, she would write, you know, lyrics and songs on her notebooks and things like that and uh, she had uh, an, an English journal that she had the, the, the journal like for 10 minutes in class each day and she had gone to see Boston on the third stage tour and she had been a huge Led Zeppelin fan forever even though Led Zeppelin was defunct and she came back and she wrote all her journal over and over again she wrote Boston rules rock over and over and over again and so in honor of that and it's also funny, too, to go read about all her old boyfriends. Aren't these guys she was hooked up on? You know, you know I mean? it's like you're, you got such a crush on this. I wish so-and-so would ask me out. I like so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so asked me out, but I don't, 
I don't want to go out with them. And so-and-so tried to kiss me. You know, uh, it's funny to go back and read that stuff. I'm not jealous about that kind of stuff. I mean, maybe I would have been a teenager, but I'm not jealous about that stuff. I, I, I know I'm not a pioneer, right? It's part of the deal. You know, all those guys, just a long line of losers who were just in my chair. But, uh, yeah, not just because of that, but, you know, listen, sonically, Boston was just at a different level. I mean, they really were at a different level, and it all ends so sadly. I mean, it really does. But um, in 76, our song is going to be more than a feeling from Boston because things changed with them. You know, it's like all of a sudden, riff rock was a thing. Like, you had all this mystical stuff with Zeppelin and even with Queen in some respects and you Black Sabbath. But Boston was just pure, unadulterated rock and roll, man. They just plugged in and went. Let's hell, let's just crank the apps up and let's go get, get it done, right? Now, I don't know if you guys know this, and I'm going to share this with you if you haven't, if you don't know. Uh, of course, Boston, man, it's legendary. I mean, again, you, you put on that first album and uh, you don't have to stop. But Brad Delp, of course, uh, you know, Brad killed himself. And uh, you may not know why he killed himself, and, and I'm going to share some of that with you. And it's uh, it's very inappropriate, and it's very unsettling, and and uh, I'm going to offer you a little bit of uh, viewer discretion here, or listener discretion. But Brad Delp uh, had broke up with love of his life, and he was trying to get back with her, and her sister, believe it or not, was living with him, because they were all so close, and he, he put a video camera, like in her room, and spied on her, and she found it. And... Um, that ultimately he was so incredibly embarrassed and knew that uh, the sister, the woman he was trying to woo back, would find out he couldn't deal with it, and he killed himself. And, um, you know, it's a shame. I mean, not just the perversion and the violation of the whole thing. I mean, obviously he's completely wrong in what he did, but it's a shame that uh, he elected to take those steps that led to that depression that ultimately led to his suicide. And uh, the, the thing that I will tell you, too, and again, you can always dial 988 to have somebody to talk to, and maybe you've done something that you believe is unforgivable, and as egregious as that was, that doesn't mean there probably wasn't a road home and maybe not one to reconciliation, but uh, it would have been a temporary thing. You know, Brad Delp obviously could have uh, you know, probably found a way to kind of move forward and soldier on in life, but uh, he felt that the pain was simply too much to take. Uh, and he killed himself. And uh, the girl's sister, his ex, is the one that found him. And um, it's just one of those things you look back in hindsight and say, man, what a, what a tragic end uh, to a very talented individual's life. Uh, but um, more than a feeling, that's a song that everybody knows. You know, it, it's, unrec it's recognizable. It's unmistakable. That's what I was looking for when you hear those opening riffs. All right, 1977, we touched on them a little bit here. Uh, but uh, the Eagles, many could argue it's Aerosmith or the Eagles is America's greatest rock band. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go more towards Aerosmith because Eagles at the time, especially with some of the Glenn Fry tracks, was a little more country. Like I love Lion Eyes, I do, but it's not really a rock song, right? It's not. But when Joe Walsh joined the band, things began to change and the Eagles began to have more of an edge. Next thing you know, they weren't doing as much of the... Uh, you know, the best of my love type stuff. It's Hotel California. And uh, it's it's funny, too. We were out in L.A. And uh, and we drove by, and it was like a Hotel California sign. And then it's like, hey, look, there's the Hotel California. So that is a Hotel California. That is not the Hotel California. Uh, that's out in uh, south uh, of San Diego. It's out, Well, not south San Diego. That'd be in Tijuana. But it's outside of San Diego. And... Uh, if you don't know this, like Hotel California, and a lot of people have tried to argue against this, but the evidence is overwhelming. In many respects, Hotel California is about uh, really the, the founding of the church uh, of Satan. Anton LaVey, of course, it's, you know, there's all these things about that. And so there's this mystical part of this that is uh, um, really the undercurrent in the song. It, a lot of people don't fully understand what they're listening to. And they're not in support of it. They're just kind of telling a story about it. You know, the whole part about, um, you know, welcome to the Hotel California. What a lovely place. Uh, and you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. You know, that's the whole cultish part of it, right? And so 
Uh, it's, there's some great stories out there that, are, that have been written about this song, and it is a very much an iconic song in American music, but uh, we needed to include it today just because of the fact, uh, not that we support uh, what the song may be about, but uh, number one, to, to, to provide some clarity about the track, but also, too, to kind of recognize you know, the musicianship in this is ridiculous. It absolutely is. All right, 1978, huge year in music and really changed everything because of one new band from California. And none of those guys are from California. They just went out to LA to make it. It's Van Halen. Van Halen 1 dropped in 78. Now, I initially was going to go with uh, Ain't Talking About Love because I love it. Uh, but the bride talked me into, no, you got to go with uh, the one that started it all, track one. CD one, album one, running with the devil. It's kind of ironic considering that we just followed up the Hotel California. But um, you were starting to kind of get, not that Van Halen was one of these bands, but you were starting to kind of get a little bit of this uh, occult influence in the lyrical content of music. And again, some of that, again, really kind of permeated from Black Sabbath. You know, Black Sabbath, of course, um, you know, a big part of the 70s, as was Kiss. And so a lot of people are like, hey, these guys are not like us. They must be evil. And in some respects, they were. But a lot of it was an act. A lot of it was an attempt to sell records. Uh, There are some people out there that were a genuine article. Uh, You listen to some of that, you know, devil music and death metal from, uh, from Scandinavia. I think those guys are probably real. I don't think it's an act. But, um, but Running with the Devil in 78 kind of pales by comparison. But it ushered in Eddie Van Halen. All of a sudden, we had never heard anybody play guitar like this, ever. And there have been some great guitar players, of course. So, you know, we don't have Deep Purple on our list today. But, you know, uh, Richie Blackmore is a guy, obviously, that is, is worthy of, of acknowledgement. Uh, there's, no, there's no question about that. Uh, Toto didn't make our list today. Steve Lukather, we had a list of him recently, the guitar player's guitar player. The guy's played over a 1,000 hits in his life. Tommy Shaw from Styx, maybe not a great soloist, but a great riff guy. They didn't make our list either. Tom Petty, of course, uh, didn't make our list. But, um, you know, a lot of people are going to be upset that uh, Pink Floyd didn't make it, but they didn't. In 1979, our final track, the third album, from a great band comprised of both British and American players. And as Mick Jones said one day, no matter what country they went in, somebody was going to be a foreigner. And yes, we're talking foreigner. Great album. I love this album. I like everything. Probably the first four albums with Foreigner are about as good as it gets. And we were really starting to get into radio rock. You know, people were beginning to rock. It was okay to hear loud guitars on the radio. And Foreigner's Head Games was one of those songs uh, and, and listen, 79 was a weird year in music, too, because disco was a big thing. Like, you know, you look at the rock charts, like Bee Gees and Michael Jackson and, you know, uh, and great, great talents for sure, but not rock and roll. And so, again, it was, rock was kind of considering a melting pot, but disco was a big thing. And so record companies were kind of pushing all that out there. Remember the disco duck from Rick Dees and all that kind of craziness? Like everything was disco. Everything. Even Kiss did a disco record. It's true. I was made for loving you. You know, that's disco. Absolutely disco. But you began to see that music was changing. And bands like Foreigner kind of took the mantle and ran with it. And again, it was safe. It was relationship-related type music. And uh, Head Games, of course, a little different deal. The cover of that album was very disturbing to some people. And um, it's interesting considering that what passes today for art. But basically what happened is uh, this girl had gone into a bathroom to erase her name or wipe her, her number off a bathroom stall. That's what it's about. Yeah, that, that's the whole thing. And it was so controversial at the time. It's like, oh my gosh, why would somebody do this? What's a girl trying to protect her reputation? And you know, maybe somebody's put something out there about her that's inappropriate. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. I mean, today's social media, you don't need the bathroom stall anymore to find out who to call to get a good time. Uh, but you understand my point. And so that was very provocative back then and considered very controversial. We've come a long way, you know, not that anybody should be writing girls' phone numbers on walls. I'm not suggesting that at all, but uh, it's just, it's incredible to go back and look at hindsight and say, you know what, that was considered objectionable. 
And nowadays, like if you it, people would have to have it explained to them, what what's that even mean? It's true. All right, but that's our 1970s list. And uh, guys, this is so much fun. I, I'll be honest with you. I had to spend a lot of time working on this between this and working on the book and uh, opening a business and covering the Bulldogs. I, I don't have a lot of time, but this is fun for me. Working those old Duty Noble records are fun, but that's also part of the work. This doesn't feel like work to me. This is great. And I enjoy celebrating this music with you. If you guys, if you have ideas for the top 10 list, reach out and let us know. Best way to do that is to hit up Roy on Twitter at dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. And, of course, we're on hiatus for, uh, for doing those lists for a couple of weeks as we work through our journey into sound. Uh, you can find me on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R. And uh, we'll certainly uh, give your list to Gander. Just might do it on the show. We can give you credit for the idea. But thanks, as always, for your support of the Top 10 List. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Book Mart, a Starkvillian institution. I love Campus Book Mart. You, too. Uh, if you don't, it's because you've never met them. It's as simple as that. Great, great people doing a great job for a great fan base. Next time you're in town, go by and check them out. Neatly positioned on the backside of campus, just turn off 182 right there at the Trooper Station. We encourage you to obey the post and speed limit signs. And wind your way around, and right there on the left, just before you get to campus, there's Campus Bookmark. Go in there, peruse their fine selections of Bulldog merchandise, whether you're looking to, um, to decorate your fan cave, maybe outfit yourself, your office, your pet, your RV, your automobile. I don't know your needs, but chances are they can fill them for you. If you can't make it to town, we encourage you, as always, to support a Starkville business. We'll make it easy for you. Give a little incentive. Visit campusbookmart.net and use promo code BSR. That stands for Beautiful Steve Roberts, and that gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bones, absolutely incomplete. Plenty of Bulldog baseball merchandise in there. Many of it you've never seen. And when you see it, you're going to want to have it. And you can get it, whether it be online or in person. Campus Bookmark, certainly the best place to buy Mississippi State merch. All right. We mentioned not playing last night. And uh, I submit to you, maybe that was a good thing. You know, we've had this midweek malaise, you know, and it's like all of a sudden we got a little juice again. We beat Georgia. Uh, UAB is a bit of an RPI killer. But, um, you know, again, the right decision was made. But I think in the end it may prove to be a good thing for State. But also, too, it's just – it's just a weird night. So let's get through the, um, I guess, the games that maybe went the way we expected. Georgia, very angry, very angry. They went 15-5 to over Kennesaw State. Kennesaw State has been kind of a Power 5 killer this year. They've done a really good job. But Georgia's like, nah, not at Foley Field, bro. Nah, we're going to get this taken care of. So 15-5, and uh, I'm sure that uh, – you know, Fernando Gonzalez, that suspension really prevented them from getting to 20 runs. But uh, man, it is what it is. Vanderbilt crushes Middle Tennessee State 14 to 1. Tennessee all over Alabama AM 20 to 2. Arkansas, 5 1 winners. They're actually playing baseball right now, but Arkansas and the uh, Razorbacks have an early 2 0 lead there. South Carolina, big win for them. Disappointing weekend. They bounce back in the midweek and they take down North Carolina in Charlotte, two to one. Big win for the Gamecocks for sure. North Carolina, of course, uh, now currently projected to host Mississippi State in an NCAA baseball regional, according to today's Baseball America NCAA tournament projections. Go out there as a two seed. That's fine. We'll put the Diamond Dogs up against the Diamond Heels. We'll go. Let's get it done. Not scared of those guys. A&M comes from behind to take down UTSA in a 6-5 ball game. A lot of our people on the jeanspage.com message boards were, uh, were monitoring. Like, hey, this is significant. And listen, I'm going to say it for what it is. a and is a better team than I thought. And I still don't think there's a lot of length in that order. And when they run across somebody with lead pitching, it's going to be interesting. But they can swing it. And that's what happens. It's like well, you stay in a close ball game with them and eventually they turn the order over. They will eventually get you, whether it be Montgomery or Lavulay. They will find a way to get you. A Pelsa good swinger, too. Missouri, flying high. After a three-game sweep of Florida, we got this, guys. And what do they do? They drop a game to SIU Edwardsville, 5-4 in Como. You want to take the air out of the balloon? That'll do it. You know, we know from experience, you losing to Central Arkansas last week. 
It's like, you know, we go down to Florida and we think, man, things are good. Things are good. Speaking of Florida, things are not good. Guys, they get beat 19-4. At Mike Martin Field there at Tallahassee, 19-4. And I believe at Florida State's now 3-0 against Florida in non-conference. Now, Florida loses over the weekend. They've lost four straight. What's happening in Gainesville? We all said it when we left from down there. We should have swapped. We should have. And again, I think we got beat on Sunday. We gave it away on Friday. But, you know, that could be the difference in hosting and not. That's a true story. I think we're going to look back and say, how in the world did we not beat these guys? All right, South Alabama. You know, he beat Mississippi State and come back from behind fashion down in Biloxi. They march into Tuscaloosa and take down the Crimson Tide 5-4. I think Alabama's good. I don't think they're great. And I think that uh, by the time we get a hold of those guys, you're going to see some things that are going to be – things will come into focus. Now, Kentucky also playing a former Mississippi State midweek opponent. They go down to Joe Lee Griffin Field on the campus of Sanford, and Sanford gets Kentucky 9-7. What a huge win for the Bulldogs of Birmingham. I can promise you Nick Mangione is not happy today. Of course, he's getting ready for a weekend series. But, um, yeah, that's, not, that's a good result for us because it helps the RPI. It's always very interesting. Now, what is not good is Alabama State goes into Auburn and comes out with a 3-2 win. It's nuts, man. And I'll be honest with you, Auburn is not nearly as, as bad, I think, as uh, – Maybe this score suggests, but offensively, they are a far cry from what people projected, and I think their pitching has been been a joke. I mean, it really has been, and uh, that, that's a real surprise because Butch is such a great pitching coach, but uh, you got some guys you're counting on that uh, haven't come through. LSU shells McNeese State. The Cowboys go down to the Bayou Bengals 16 and nothing down at Alec Box Stadium. Ole Miss's game with Murray State was postponed. State's game with UAB was canceled, and, and as soon as I saw that Ole Miss was – postponing their game, I thought, you know what, we'll probably do the same, not just because of geography, but also, too, from a competitive standpoint, now everybody's got all their pitchers for the weekend. This is a huge series for both teams. Certainly for us, you know, we were 21-6 and six in the last 27 against Ole Miss. I think that's correct. And you got to feel like if you're Ole Miss, you're like, guys, if, if we get – matter of fact, I've got um, – uh, I've got a uh, an Ole Miss friend that uh, texts me from time to time, and he says, you know, if State gets swept this weekend by Mississippi State, then it is going to be an absolute PR nightmare. Well, the thing about it is, friends, I think most Ole Miss people acknowledge the fact that Mississippi State is a better program. They may not mention it at cocktail parties or out there when they're eating, uh, you know, cold chicken tenders under on a paper plate under a chandelier or anything. But I think by and large people say, you know, Mississippi State's a better program. Now, we've had a good run as of late, but I think the Bianco run is over. I think everybody recognizes that, and I, I don't think that they would be uh, totally upset if they made a change at the end of the year. Well, let's be honest about that. In 2022, if they hadn't got hot late, Mike Bianco is probably not even your coach there. True story. And uh, we'll get a chance to kind of add to the uh, you know, to the rivalry this week. And uh, it's interesting. It's so incredibly interesting to look at this stuff and you begin to ask yourself, you know, what, you know what's, what's next? We're going to preview the Ole Miss series on Friday's show. But uh, we are going to have a couple of series, obviously, that, uh, that get underway on Thursday. And uh, let's take a quick look at that. We'll, we'll, we'll make our way back to the um, – the MySpace version of uh, the SEC website. It's so. It's such a. Again, I. I. I can't say it enough. I, I absolutely cannot say it enough. How bad this thing is. It's. It's so bad. It's so not user friendly. I mean, it's almost like I feel like I'm being punked. You. You know what I mean? It's like it's like what? What? I got to do this. Got to do that. All right, so tonight's, you know, tonight's or today's games, of course, uh, you know, uh, Arkansas and San Jose State, where I mentioned that one. Uh, so tomorrow you're going to have two series get underway. Missouri is at Georgia. Um, 
And I'm curious to see, you know, Missouri, you know, of course, Missouri's not great. Florida going on the road, probably a little bit cocky, and uh, Missouri gets some. I, 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 I like Georgia, especially being at Foley Field. It's nuts, man. I mean, it really is. And, and I think if Missouri could take one, it'd be great. But down there in that launching pad, it's going to be tough. Kentucky's at Auburn. And, man, when you start looking at this Kentucky and Auburn thing, you know, you know, it's the battle of the net. John Cohen assistant coaches here. But if I told you two years ago, hey, Kentucky's going to be in the top ten and Auburn's going to be in danger of missing Hoover, you wouldn't believe it. You'd say, what? Not Nick. Nick's going to get fired. But no, Nick instead goes and uh, plays a Super Regional against the uh, eventual NAFL champion last year, rides a ship, gets a big extension, and that next thing you know, Tadford leading the Southeastern Conference four weekends in. It's nuts now. Let's take a quick look at our standings, and then we're going to get into some basketball stuff. And we'll get you out the door. Uh, Kentucky 11 and 1. Uh, we're looking at the East first. Kentucky's 11 and 1. And uh, 27 and 5 overall. That's a pretty gaudy number. And Nick is a guy that knows how to schedule the RPI well. He's just one of those kind of guys in non conference. He doesn't mind going on the road to play that road series if it gets him a couple of points in the RPI. Nick is no dummy. One of the smart, smartest people that I know. Vanderbilt's 8-4 and four and 26-7 and seven overall. I'm looking forward to going up to Nashville and play. I think we can get that series. I, I do. I know what they did at LSU this weekend. I think we're going to pitch it a lot better than LSU. Tennessee is 7-5. and five. I still expect Tennessee to make a run. they got to figure out the Friday night pitch. And they're 27-6 and six over and all, overall. But, again, you know, five of those losses coming in the league. Uh, even, even dropped the game to Ole Miss. What a big win that was for Ole Miss for sure. South Carolina now 6-6, six and 23-10. Six, and, and Guys, Florida. 500 in the league, two games over 500 overall. And they say midweeks don't matter. Guys, they're 17 and 15. That's brutal, man. 17 and 15. This is a team that played for the NAFL championship last year and returned some key pieces. And you think about how great that series was between Florida and LSU last year, and all of a sudden you look up now, and both of these teams are struggling. I know LSU still projected to make the tournament in Florida should too, but my goodness, you got to start winning some games. You can't get it on potential. Georgia now five and seven and sixth in the SEC East, twenty five and eight overall. And again, their non conference schedule a bit of a joke. Missouri four and eight and fifteen and nineteen, the lone team in the Southeastern Conference to have a losing overall record. Arkansas is eleven and one in the league and twenty eight and three. Still my pick to win an Apple championship. Not just the SEC, but the NAFL championship. And, and, again, it's going to be interesting how they play outside of Bomb Stadium. And, and that will probably be Omaha, right? I mean, let's just be honest about that. You know, you remember how great Arkansas was in 2021? This team is not as good as that one. And that team didn't make it to Omaha. This team offensively has had some real challenges. But uh, it's going to be interesting. Won nine games in a row and about to win number 10. Texas A&M, again, they're better than I thought they were. I'm just going to say it for what it is. Their pitching is incredibly improved, and I didn't know that we'd be able to say that. But 8-4 and four in the conference, 29-4 and four overall. Of course, they went undefeated 21-0 in a non-conference and a very, very light non-conference. They played some talented midweek games against Lamar, I guess. But, um, again, this is a team also that uh, it'll be interesting to see how they play outside of their own ballpark. They've been very, very good at home, 21-1 and one, uh, there at Bluebell Park. They've only played uh, eight true road games. Only, they're five and three there. Everybody struggles to win on the road, including them losing at Florida. I'm sure they're sitting just like Mississippi State thinking, you know what, hey, we blew it against Florida. But a and certainly in line for a top eight national seed. Your Bulldogs, six and six and 21 and 12. We'd like to be able to get a win last night and get back to 10 games over 500, but um, have to, to account for that this weekend. Alabama now four and eight and then 22 and 11. So basically – uh, a near identical record to the Bulldogs overall. And some people early on are like, hey, Steve, Alabama's better than us. They passed us with a brand-new coach. And now they have begin to kind of come back to the pack. And this is a team, too, that um, really struggles away from their ballpark. They're 3-7 and seven in true road games. LSU's 3-9. and nine. 22 and 12 overall, but 3-9 and nine in the league. And uh, I don't think anybody expected that. I didn't. And I understand that they've uh, played a difficult schedule, but uh, they're LSU. They're the defending NFL champions. I expected them to take a big step back this year, but not this significant. But I, I will tell you, as the wind 
patterns change and the temperature heats up, so do the Tigers. Now, that's not going to help their pitching much, but uh, they'll be able to win some church league softball type games on Sunday and I think uh, improve the record. Ole Miss 3-9, they lost seven games in a row. They're 18-15 and 15 overall with a team that's coming in this weekend that uh, has won 21 of the last 27 against them. We got to win this series, guys. We need to sweep. Yeah, of course, I'll take the win, but we need to go in there and sweep. If we go in there and sweep, we put our right back, ourselves right back in the conversation to potentially host. You know, again, we're a solid two seed right now. You begin to kind of work your way up. You got to again, you got to get fat in the month of April if you're Mississippi State because the schedule is a lot more favorable. Because even your road games are games you expect to win. You know that series at Nashville will be will be interesting, but uh, I think that's an offensive ballpark that kind of caters well to us too. Uh, they've pitched it pretty well, but uh, scoring's been an issue until they kind of run into that LSU bullpen that uh, has been a, a a really 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 disappointing group. Auburn now two and ten and eighteen and fourteen, and again you start thinking about who's not going to make Hoover. Everybody already says, okay, well it's going to be Missouri and somebody else. And right now, Missouri is ahead of Auburn, Ole Miss, and LSU and tied with Alabama thanks to last weekend's sweep. So now you start thinking, hey, if you're, if you're Auburn, it's as tough. They're 2-10, and 10, guys, 2-10 and 10 in a league. You, know, you like to be around 500 in a league and feel like you, you've done enough. You're 12 games in, you got 18 left. If you lose... Six of those 18, you got a losing record in this conference. Let that sink in for a second. They could win every series the rest of the way and still have a losing record in conference. That's nuts to think about. They'd be 14 and 16. If they win every series, two games to one, the rest of the slate, they would still have a losing record. That's why it's so incredibly difficult in this very unforgiving league to kind of climb out of all that stuff. It's terrible. It is. But that's where it stands today. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. If you're bringing a larger group of folks to town, look no further than the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Just Google the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Their Facebook page will auto-populate. You can go check out the pictures and see all the fine amenities that are available to you and your guests as you uh, host a large group here in Starkville. Five bedrooms, two baths, that incredible living room area, the huge back porch. It's an old renovated clubhouse. Uh, super, super cool, super clean. Nice place to bring your guests. Got that great wet bar. Got a full-service kitchen. The fire pit area outside is five minutes away from the Mississippi State campus. It's quiet. You only got a couple neighbors. We don't want you out there, you know, you know, throwing a Molly Crew concert or something. But uh, you can get out there and kind of enjoy yourself and not have a lot of intrusion. You can have some peace and quiet. Whether you're bringing a work group to town for midweek and you thought about, hey, we got to go get five hotel rooms. It's awfully expensive. This may be the better way to go. Get a house. So we've got these communal areas to work and everybody can retreat to their quarters in the evening. You get a good night's rest. Or maybe you want to bring your family to town. Maybe you say, hey, Steve, it's a ball game weekend. We're going to come down there and just enjoy being together. Maybe it's a staycation. Maybe you live in the area and you think, you know what? I just want to get out of the house and just get everybody together. My house isn't big enough to entertain all the friends that I want to come be a part of this. You can book through a variety of ways. You can go through Airbnb, you can go through VRBO, or if you book through the Evolve website, I can save you some money. Use promo code BSR10. It saves you 10% off your stay. Now you could, I don't know, maybe you got it like that. You say, Steve, I don't need a promo code. I, I'm using promo codes, man, like they're running out of style, right? I mean, that's just me. Anytime I can save a few bucks here or there, I'm happy to do it. So by being a listener of this show, we can do that for you. Save you 10%. Again, Google the Stark Vegas Clubhouse, book to the Evolve website, and use promo code BSR10. All right. Uh, bad news to report today. And I say bad news because I like Keyshawn Murphy. Uh, I really do. He's in the portal now. And uh, there was some discussion. We, we thought Murph might be okay, but we weren't sure. He just wants a bigger piece of the pie. I mean, it's not a situation where, you know, Keyshawn has, has done a bad thing or anything. But, uh, yeah, we've had some guys that have left. And um, – to me, this is the one that stings the most. It really does. And you can say, but Steve, he didn't play a lot last year. There were times he didn't, but I think he makes us a better team with his length, his rebound ability. Uh, he is a guy that is a, a tenacious defender at times. He is the fourth player now to enter the portal. That's Jaquan Scott, Trey Ford, and Shaquille Moore. 
Um, Andrew Taylor, of course, been in the portal a long time, but um, we got a handful of scholarships available now too, and uh, that's going to make for an interesting stretch. Speaking of stretch, we, we discussed we've got to get a center, and uh, that is priority one. Got to get a three, and now with some other changes on the roster, uh, it'll be interesting. Of course, you're bringing some signees to class, but you've got some room uh, to work with. But um, you know, a lot of people are wondering, Steve, what's going on going with Chris Jans? Well, you know, I, I expect Chris to stay I, unless something crazy happens. I, I really do. And uh, of course, the news, you know, this, you know, last night, um, you know, some attrition on the Mississippi State staff. And that's part of the deal, right? And that's just, you know, that's what happens. You know, people want to advance their careers. Not everybody's in love with Mississippi State. Not just all willing to be an assistant coach here forever, but James Miller leaving for Oklahoma State. And so that opens up an opening here. And that's the thing you begin to think about. With new blood coming in, perhaps there are some relationships they have that we don't that could help us in the portal and on the recruiting trail. Uh, but I, I, I'm not worried about Chris Jans leaving. I was more worried about it two weeks ago. Not so worried about it now. Now, of course, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Kentucky. That may set another round of dominoes. But it is kind of unsettling that he hadn't signed the contract extension. I know that they have talked about that for a while. Uh, but, again, that's how the game is played. I understand that I harbor no ill will against Chris. I know some of our donors may. I mean, he'll have to go on the forgiveness tour, right? Um, but the reality of it is, is he is our coach, and uh, I think he's done a great job here at Mississippi State, which is why he's been mentioned in connection – with some of the other jobs. Uh, I don't feel slighted by anybody trying to advance their career, whether they work with me or whether they work uh, for the teams that we cover. I mean, that's just kind of how life is, right? Everybody is looking for the next level. And that's okay. You can't take that stuff personal. You just got to keep working hard and making your situation the best you possibly can. But it is frustrating when you have to, um, you have to re- replace people that, uh, that you trust. You, know, you don't want to hold them back, though. Uh, and so... Chris Jans, again, very talented coach. He'll do a good job uh, figuring this thing out. And, again, I, I don't think he's going anywhere, but I will feel a whole lot better once we announce that extension and we can all just kind of relax and look forward to next year. But, yeah, it's, you got some traffic in the portal. But this is the one to me that – this is the one that bothers me. I mean, this is the one you look at and say, eh, man, really if we could have found a way to work this thing out. You know, Shaquille Moore, we love that kid too, but uh, you bring in another – player at his position I'm sure he's thinking I'm not going to be the third guard in a three guard rotation I'm not going to do it I'll, I'll go play Virginia Commonwealth if I have to but I'm not I'm not going to do this you know and I get that too especially going into your final year you don't want to spend the majority of your time of your final year sitting on the bench appreciate their contributions to Mississippi State basketball but we all move forward that's how life works of course uh, there'll be some some traction on the women's side too I think Sam Purcell uh, a guy that's going to do a good job for us. And uh, I, I know what happened down the stretch last year well, was very unsettling and disconcerting, but I, I have a lot of faith in Sam. Uh, Jessica Carter, of course, we kind of went as she did. And, uh, you know, we got to find some pieces. We do. We got to find some pieces. And, and we will. We're Mississippi State. I mean, you know, it's, you know, we, we've done some good things, but uh, not making the NCAA tournament last year, I think, in some respects, kind of takes the bloom off the rose for some people. But, uh, I still believe in, in Sam Purcell. I, I do. I think we'll get it all taken care of. All right, if you haven't done so, go to windthebottomfalls.com, and you can uh, order uh, Window Bottom Falls and all my sports titles. They're all there. You can peruse through them. Flim Flam, Stark Villains, Alpha Dogs, uh, Dogpile. Every Bulldog needs a copy of Dogpile. And with Mother's Day and Father's Day coming up, maybe think ahead. You know, maybe, maybe Dad hadn't read one of those books. Maybe you want to complete the collection. Or maybe you don't have any of them, but every bulldog deserves dog pile. And if you've got that smarmy almost brother-in-law, pick up a copy of Flim Flim. I'm happy to sign it for you. Have a good time with that. You know, making a difference to me what you do with it when you buy it. But um, yeah, working really hard on this new book, and um, you know, we'll share some things. You never know what I'm going to uncover. I mean, yeah, I, I never know from one day to the next. I get so excited about things. You're know, finding new names. You know, finding these old ball players that were such a big part of our program that we have not recognized because of the fact that. Uh, you know, a lot of time has passed. You know, that's just kind of how life is and how life works. You know, at some point, people will forget us. It's a shame to say, but it's true. You know, I think about my own grandfather, you know, Otis Robertson Sr. I never met him. Uh, I mentioned his name from time to time. And uh, recently, you know, my daughter's getting ready to take the LSAT. And, you know, I talked about how he worked uh, 80 hours, six days a week. 
on a dairy farm on Augusta Road outside of Ellisville, Mississippi, to make a better life for his family. And now all of a sudden, one of his descendants is about to uh, go to the Ivy League in law school. It's pretty incredible stuff, you know. And so every generation wants to build upon the other one. But, um, you know, you, you want to always recognize their contributions to your family and to your life. And uh, that's one of the things that I've taken such pride in with the Duty Noble book is uh, really kind of bringing duty to life for a lot of people because so many people, including myself, uh, didn't know much about him. Just kind of had you know, kind of a basic knowledge of who he was. Oh, we named a baseball stadium after him. What, what's that about? You know, well, he played here and was a really accomplished guy and coached here for a while, became our AD. And, uh, and so that was notable in of itself. But I've unearthed some stories that um, – are going to allow you to get to know Duty Noble more as a coach, a player, and a person, and certainly as an athletic director. And uh, one of the things that I can tell you is that I don't know that we've ever had uh, a stronger advocate, a guy that was willing to fight for Mississippi State, even if that meant making, uh, making peace with some of his enemies in order to advance our causes here in Starkville, Mississippi. All right, but well, thanks so much as always, guys. And uh, come be a part of everything over at jeanspage.com. And uh, a, lot, a lot of cool stuff here as of late. Of course, you can go read that article rivalry week the missing games uh, it was a lot of fun to write a lot of fun to research and been a lot of fun to read all the reaction to it you can read that it's a free story and uh, come be a part of it over there man we, we, nobody's going to cover the bulldogs like we are and um, the reality of that is is that um, women we've been doing this a long time and uh, it's not just a job for us it's a passion we feel it just like you do when we win we're thrilled when we lose we're upset we may not go on Twitter and uh, start adding players and things like that and, and tell them how much that they, uh, they stock that night. We're not going to do that. Uh, we've got a reputation and some professionalism to uphold. But uh, we feel it just like you do. And because of the fact that uh, we know what you experience, it's important for us to be able to paint the picture for you, to be your eyes and ears as it relates to Mississippi State athletics. Uh, so we look forward uh, to this weekend series. And uh, we'll be back with you guys on Friday and to preview the Mississippi State Road Series uh, at Ole Miss. And uh, we look forward uh, to hopefully taking another series and advancing our cause to get to the postseason. But until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.